welcome to this week's Mark's Mouthpiece. My guest today is David Federley. Uh, Dave, of course, is the former principal tuba of the Baltimore Symphony. Uh, he's on the faculty at the University of Maryland. He's taught at Peabody, Juilliard. David, did I miss anywhere else? DePaul University DePaul. in Chicago. You know, yep, DePaul University. Uh, played with many other major orchestras, including the Chicago Symphony, and is very much a protege of Arnold Jacobs, so we'll be talking about that a lot tonight. And uh, David, it's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you. Thanks for doing this. Good to be here. Oh, and uh, full disclosure, uh, David is, is important to me. We have, I've had a few lessons with him, and he's always been dynamite and super supportive, and uh, I'm sure anybody that's studied with you will attest to the same. Um, but I do have one question, though. What's that? No, I moved just into South Carolina below Charlotte, where you used to live, and you moved out of Charlotte. Is there any coincidence in that? Or is it... There's... <laughs> It was, it was nothing personal, I promise. <laughs> Only one state away. Now, if I had moved to like, you know, Pennsylvania, okay. it might be different. <laughs> uh, so uh, can you talk about how you came to the tuba and your beginnings with music? Uh, well, I'm from a real tiny town in northern Minnesota, up in the sticks, on Lake Superior, about 60 miles northeast of Duluth, which is where I was born. And I had took piano early on and, and, you know, back then they did the hearing test and I did real well. And so they wanted me to get into band. And so my, my brother played drums and we had a drum set at home. And my sister, who's older than my brother, uh, had actually played sousaphone, which is why they had the fiberglass sousaphones. Anyhow, I walked into to Ron Gray and I said, I want to play drums. And he said, no, I've got too many drummers. And I said, then I'm going to play trumpet. And knowing my face, it wouldn't work at all. <laughs> and he, he said, no, I've got too many trumpet players. I said, then I'm going to play trombone or nothing. This is fifth grade. And uh, he says, no, you come back Thursday. I have an instrument and you won't have to rent it. And so I came in and there was a brand new King sousaphone sitting on a winger chair. And that was it. So I started on tuba and um, soon got better than it on tuba than piano. So I quit piano. I was playing during the summers. Uh, the band band director, Edgar Baseman, let me play with the high school band during the summers when I was in like sixth and seventh grade. So and by eighth grade, I was playing in both the junior high band. Back then it was junior high, mm -hmm. junior high band and senior high band. And um, that's how it happened. I was lucky. I ran into had a really great high school band director uh, who I'm still in, in contact with. He studied with Steve Chenette. His name is Nick Van mm -hmm. and at the University of Minnesota. And he got me to go to Bemidji Music Camp, which is in the middle of nowhere in central Minnesota. Right. <laughs> and uh, David McCormick said, you need to go study with Arnold Jacobs. And Paul Walton, who had studied with Arnold Jacobs and used to play tuba in the Minnesota Orchestra, I bought my first tuba from Paul. He said, you need to go study with Arnold Jacobs. And so that's how I ended up studying with Arnold Jacobs. But now is there a story about your audition for, to get into Northwestern? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I, so John Painter, a, a lot of the people at Bemidji Music Camp for the summer were people from Chicago. And John Painter, the director of bands, was up there, and Glencliff Bainham, who had been the previous one, Fred Hemke, who was the sax teacher at Northwestern, um, was also head of Winds and Brass. He was there. And so David McCormick told them all about me, and I met with Hemke and talked to him. But then we're playing Scenes from the Louvre, and John Painter, big band, probably 100 and 20 kids, and I'm sitting first. Painter stops the band. He says, first tuba, can you play that first page down an octave? Let's play it again. So I did. It wasn't a big deal. And uh, he stopped the band after the first page. He says, tuba player doesn't realize it, but he just took his audition for Northwestern, and he got in. So that was it. I never auditioned. Mr. Jacobs never listened to any auditions. So that was it. I was... I. The, Next time I saw Northwestern and John Painter was when I was unloading my car to move into the dorm. Now, what year was that when you started at Northwestern? Uh, 1972. Okay. 
the Jurassic period. The Jurassic. Well, you you got there then, right? Sort of at the at, in the early part of the Schulte era for the CSO, then, right? Yes. Right. So. Yep. Wow. So uh, now I know you said your your uh, siblings played instruments. Did, were, were your parents musical at all, or was there music? In no, the not at all. No. Nope. Um, my brother ended up being a, a English teacher and a real estate agent, and my sister was. Um, has been a CEO of several different places. She's retired now. Okay. And uh, but no, I was the only one who went into music. Now, were you listening to much music growing up and, and on your own or out of curiosity? Um, my band director had us playing a lot of band stations, right? Orchestral pieces for band, and I played in a Duluth Youth Orchestra, mm -hmm. and then my my senior year, um, the tuba player in the Duluth Symphony, which is kind of a semi-pro orchestra, um, retired or quit or whatever, and they needed somebody for a year. And so they called me up. And so my senior year, I played in the Duluth Symphony and we played some pretty good literature then. Mm -hmm. um, and Paul Walton, I would go down to Minneapolis and Paul worked, was a brass repairman at growth at that point. He had played in the Minnesota Orchestra about 13 years and quit. And so Paul would kind of coach me, you need these books and these books and you need these orchestral literature because growth music had all this, this material. And so I would buy it and then I would listen to recordings. Not as much as I should have. I, I don't have the back, didn't have the background that many people have that have gone to interlocking or had uh, lessons with some real high powered teachers in, yeah. while they were in high school. Right. Um, one of the students I had at at uh, Juilliard was Ibanda um, Yubinka and and Ibanda was the tuba player on the Colbert Late Show. Okay. Rumbinka, Rumbinka. And he started out life, he studied with somebody who studied with me who realized very quickly he needed to move him over. And then he, Ibanda studied with uh, David Zirkel for a really long time down at EGA. Right. And then, then he came came up to so when somebody has that kind of background to study with somebody like David um, you know they've come in very advanced yeah I didn't have that yeah uh, my band director was my teacher and then my next teacher was a guy named Arnold Jacobs right <laughs> so, so let's talk about that like uh, what were, do you remember meeting Mr. Jacobs for the first time yes um, everybody was telling me I had to study with this guy I had to study with this guy I didn't have a clue who he was other than the tuba player with the Chicago Symphony. Right. So I get down to Northwestern, I'm there, and we have a couple of weeks before we start getting lessons. And I'm hearing all about Arnold Jacobs and I'm going, oh man, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> I was scared to death my first lesson. And I was in there sweating and, and Mr. Jacobs looks at me and he goes, oh, is it hot in here? And started laughing. <laughs> so yeah. Ended up becoming very, very close, and we spent about 10 years, almost weekly, together. And then still, when I was in Baltimore, I was uh, going back and forth. I'd uh, call him a lot also to talk about playing and what was going on and, and all of this. So I, we really stayed in touch all the way through until his passing. Now, what do you remember about the early studies with him? Because you came in so green. How did he sort of... <laughs> How did he sort of coalesce all these things and get you sort of on a, on a path? The, the neat thing about his teaching is wherever you are, that's where he starts teaching. Right. So he had me buzz Pop Goes the Weasel on the mouthpiece, which I had never done. And it was kind of, uh, I'm sorry. I kind of went, I'd never buzzed before. And he picks up his mouthpiece, he says, can you make it sound a little more like this? He had a bigger sound on the mouthpiece than I had on the tuba. <laughs> and, and he would say things like, the tone is not focused, which is what I was hearing before from my band director. 
but I, and so I was trying to push everything to, into this little pocket. And Mr. Jacobs very carefully said, what you've done is you've imploded the sound. You need to relax, let it open so that it can resonate. And as soon as I did that, um, the other thing he said, your articulation's not clean. And I had always been told, you have to tongue harder. Mr. Jacobs said, you're tonguing too hard. I thought, well, this guy makes a lot of money playing the tuba. I probably better listen. <laughs> and so that was kind of how things started. Um, the only time he had his water ballast uh, spirometers to check vital capacity. Right. And it was only five liters. Now, it turns out I had set almost seven and a half. I had 7.4. So I started blowing it, and the cylinder started coming out of the water. And he goes, stop, stop, stop. So I stopped and he said, man, you must have at least six liters. So he sat down after that. He looks at me and says, wow, six liters. He says, I've only got about 2.8. And he puts his hand on my leg and he says, but I still play better than you. Otherwise you wouldn't be here. <laughs> <laughs> I was so nervous at that point. That and I also remember taking about six months to understand that he was speaking English when we were talking about elevators and depressors and, you know, all of, of the obiculoris oris and all of the different medical terms that he was throwing around. It was like, uh, <laughs> and so I thought I better do some studying so I understand what he's talking about. He had quite the vocabulary. That's Yes, he did. Yeah, I remember that. Um, I'll get back to, I want to ask you some more questions, but I want to tell you that I remember being when I was a student in school, um, Harvey Phillips threw a party for the brass choir. And I, I mean, well, he invited the brass choir to a party at his house during the brass fest in 1995. And it was Mr. Jacobs 82nd birthday party. And Harvey, I'm sure you've been to his house before he has it. I had, Actually, I haven't. I wasn't. He had, he had a ranch house with a cornfield right. and a side, right. right? It was right out of a movie. And Timothy Dockchitz, who was there, all the Summit Brass guys were there. Um, I, I can't remember. I mean, it was, I'm sure I'll think of it later, but it felt like Arvin and Clark were going to walk out of the cornfield at any moment <laughs> in this field of dreams. <laughs> but what, what things did he do uh, to work on the articulation, for example? What did he say about that? Well, the, the real secret to his teaching and I think the, the thing that a lot, of, a lot of times players and teachers don't quite understand is that like when someone comes into me and they start saying, I'm having art articulation trouble and I'm having this and I'm having this, what they're really telling me is their symptoms. Right. And then you have to know what the source of that problem is as the teacher. And then the thing that he knew so well was what material to assign you that would take care of those problems. And there was a, a multifaceted approach in the case of articulation. I have a tongue. Most teachers want their students to use T-O-H. Big O-H, small consonant, right. pretty typical. The problem is when I say T-O-H, toe, Oh, my tongue is wound up way in the back of my throat. I actually in a, was in a lesson with Mr. Jacobs and he said, get the tongue down. It's up in the way in the front, get it down, get it down. And I kept pull it back. I kept pulling and it was like, it was getting worse. And I relaxed the tongue and it went forward and he says, that's it. Now he was right. It was the tongue that was in the way. He just didn't have x-ray vision mm -hmm. to know exactly where it was. Um, so what I realized is I had to figure out a way diction wise, what I had to say to keep my tongue in the right place. And so what I've come up with, came up with was T O E toe, because it's the H consonant that pulls the tongue backwards. Now, those people that don't have this issue, which is about two thirds of people, yeah. For them to say T-O-H and T-O-E, the tongue is exactly in the same place. If anybody listening says to and they've, everything's all closed up in the back, and then they say 
toe, T-O-E, what you have 10 of in your shoes, toe, you'll find the tongue is down and underneath by the teeth. Yeah. And what that allows then is instead of the tongue, you having to, we, the people that have the tongue issue like I have, is that tongue tends to, you have to have a lot of pressure to force that tongue up to the front. And that's where we start tonguing real hard. There's almost an explosion where when the tongue is forward, there's just this little, fl almost a flick of the, of the tongue. Right. And, and even more so with trombone players using D, do, well, do is just a bad toe. So it's really just a thing of really just getting that tongue to, to move just a little bit. So we would talk about that physical part. Some people think Arnold would say, no, you just don't have the right sound in your head. No, he understood when, when there were problems with the mechanics. Mm -hmm. And then you once he talked to you about that, once I knew I had to use TOE, then you go to the Arvin's book. And fairly close to the beginning of it, there's the to 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 all sorts of different articulation patterns and by getting that then then you get normalized and that's how he fixed it. He wouldn't generally say well you have a you have a terrible art problem with your tongue. Yeah. Because then immediately it you know it's like with rhythm with people, I'll say, I never tell somebody they have bad rhythm. They just haven't learned to count in most cases. I mean, seriously, that's what it is, especially tuba players, because, you know, how much do you have to count going boop, 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 and the major solo is bump, 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 bump. <laughs> for, for how many years while all the trumpet players are, and flute players and clarinet players are playing these wonderful melodies, <laughs> we just play two beat stuff. So there's a, a lesser musician there so we he really challenged that yeah but that's what he understood he wouldn't and I, I put it in the some of the first versions of Brian Fredrickson's book had what was his influence on his students and I said you know he wouldn't tell you the problem he knew what to assign you and how to make you play it musically and then he, he knew that if you did the work you were supposed to do, it would automatically take care of the problem. He was going through the back door to get to get to the problem. He used to say, don't bang on the front door. It's locked. Go around back. The screen door is wide open. It's good advice. Yes. Uh, what what uh, and back to your back to the articulation. I want to talk about Mr. Jacobs a little bit more. But what about with, uh, you know, trumpet players? A lot of times we are ta or two. How do you how do you feel like that affects articulation with players, and when you're thinking those syllables versus a toe? Does it vary by instrument, it, like high brass, low brass? Do you find any of that? No, um, I find actually the the open vowel sound helps all the instruments. Mm -hmm. the, I think that a lot of our habits come from British band, you know, British bands, and if you say "ta" with a British accent, "ta," right. Kind of, your tongue is kind of where we say toe. So okay. you can either kind of add, learn that British accent, or you can just say toe, it doesn't matter. But you know, it to me, and Arnold Jacobs would say, I don't care if you do it all wrong, as long as it sounds better than anybody else. Right. And so if it works for you, then I think that's right. But you've, but I remember working with you and the toe really was quite helpful. I thought it yes. changed the sound quite a bit. Um, what other things did he uh, assign? Did he, did he give like a fundamental routine or was it mostly a lot of etudes? How did he kind of figure those things out? He had just, Hal Leonard had just put out an advanced method for tuba with special studies by Arnold Jacobs. He never used the whole front of the book. It was, it was just his studies. And the, they were a, a lot of them actually that you find in, in your, at Mike Chikowitz's in Vince's things, the some of the flow studies. Right. Um, some of those things were in there. There was a lot of Koprosh, there was a lot of Arbins. And in that book, if you did it every day, you normalized your applying to a point where you could really depend on everything. Everything was in there. Every fundamental was in that half an hour workout of, of things. And so that's what you did, and you tried to improve it every day. His idea was that it's not a warm-up. 
that if you're playing enough, you don't have to warm up. And nobody, I didn't have time 20 minutes a day to warm up, but it was repeating the same materials at the beginning of a day, what Eddie Kleinhammer used to call maintenance work, right. like changing the oil on your car. And you remember then in the head, you get the recall, and then you try to play better than you did the day before. So there's just always trying to improve on things that you can already hear as you're playing them. Um, he always had you buzzing mm -hmm. a good five, 10 minutes beforehand and always nursery rhymes. He was okay if you want to do concertos, but he liked nursery rhymes so that you had words. Um, also something that came out the same time the book does, and I actually have a recording of it, um, is a, Hal Leonard put out a, a very cutting edge, I mean, really cutting edge for that time, small booklet, let's play the B-flat tuba with a cassette <laughs> to play along. Okay. <laughs> and the person that was doing the buzzing and playing hi-ho and who's afraid of the big bad wolf and whistle while you work and Rudolph the rain -nose reindeer, red-nosed reindeer is Arnold Jacobs. No kidding. And there is so much personality in it. And and so you had that. And then, yes, you had your Arbenz book. You had Koprash, you had Blazovich, you had Terrell, you had Bauer Murphy, you had Bona, Pasquale Bona, Vocalis, um, Walter Smith Top Tones, the Charliers, the, the blue and red French horn books, the 335 melodious and technical etudes. In fact, my first four years, I never touched an excerpt. And we never touched a solo. <laughs> Any recital or anything was my problem. <laughs> <laughs> that was quite a bit different at that time though, right? Because a lot of solos really on the tuba developed a little later, would you say? Well, we had to play recitals. You had to play recitals, but, but there's there's been more advancement of that, you would say in the past. Sure, but we, you know, we already had encounters. Um, there were a lot of transcriptions, mm -hmm. the horn concertos, the Strauss, the Mozarts, um, not so much the Haydn's. Uh, to be or not to be, the Tomasi with the trombones, um, right. the wilder things, a lot of the wilder things were out already. Uh, Von Williams was out. I mean, yeah. there was a fair amount of, yes, we, there's been a much greater amount of material coming out since then. Yeah. But but you know we had to play recital just like students yeah. do today yeah. and and uh persichetti was out so it was it was enough stuff but that was not his emphasis was on on the important things and his his concept was if you can play especially the red and blue french horn books then you will know every single style you're going to ever have to play and it's just a matter of plugging in the right notes to those styles from the excerpts. And it's really how it worked. Then it was very fast. Yeah. Because yeah. of it. Um, and you you also studied with him a long time. Can you kind of talk about how those lessons changed over the years, like everybody would develop? They, they changed some. Mm -hmm. um, as close as Mr. Jacobs and I were, when the tuba wasn't around, mm -hmm. there was always the teacher and student. And I understood that. And that's probably why we got along so, so long together. Right. Um, and I think that, I think the lessons got more intense as time went on because he could see the drive that I had. And at the beginning it was like, well, he, he didn't, he had an interesting way of letting you know he wasn't happy. Okay. He would never yell, wouldn't put you down. He might say, well, you know, what's the difference if it takes you 15 years to get, get a job? Um, things like that. Or I practiced three hours a day religiously my freshman year. And then sophomore year, um, I was property manager for the band department. And it was one of those things where if you gave two hours a day 
that person really wanted six hours a day. And when you gave six, he wanted 20. When you gave 20 hours a day, he wanted 30 hours a day. And so I wasn't practicing like I should. Right. And that went on my sophomore year. And I told my mother before I went to Northwestern, if school gets in the way of my playing, I'm going to quit school. But what I had to admit was getting in the way was all my other activities, not, not school itself. So I quit band staff and I quit uh, North Shore Band very early in my junior year. And then I went three hours a day, absolutely religiously. And that's when his interest in me got a lot higher yeah. because he, that's when the progress really started to take off. And um, so that's then getting into civic yeah. was a big thing with him. And so you had a lesson every week or a civic sectional with the other tuba player. Civic was very different back then. What it didn't pay anything. Um, if you were lucky, you got $160 every four months or something to put towards lessons. Right. So it was, it was very different. And there were two tuba players during the, during the uh, winter season. Now were those, by the way, were those lessons uh, at his house or were they at the school or when you started studying? <laughs> Mr. Jacobs never stepped foot on Northwestern's campus in the entire four years that I was there. Not juries, not auditions, not anything. My recital was taped and we listened to my recital on his reel to reel to machine in his studio. My first year and a half was at his house. And that was 8839 South Normal Street. He later moved to like 129th or something down to Beverly, um, but the, I have a picture of the old house. And uh, we were in the basement and Paul Walton had actually dug it out and plastered the walls. It was a dugout part of the basement that were, he used for teaching and practicing. Wow. And uh, so the first year and a half was there and then he moved up to um, the fine arts building for the fourth floor. They were much more, um, in some ways they were more relaxed at his house. Yeah, of course. And became very business-like in, in some ways, which wasn't bad, it was just different at, at uh, the Fine Arts Building. Right. And he remained in the Fine Arts Building the rest of his, rest of his life. Yes, the rest of his life, yes. Yeah. Um, so were there any, uh, how was he as a motor, we were kind of touching on that, how was he as a motivator with you as a student? I mean, we. I remember, like, you know, say if I put a, you know, hundred dollars on that music stand, would you play it better, or, or things like that, or somebody? He would. He would say, pretend Schultes outside the door with a contract with a hundred thousand dollars if you play well enough, or how would Bud play that? Um, the other way he would motivate, and what what motivated me to quit band staff and and North Shore band in one day. It was the 21 etudes that he assigned me for one week. <laughs> I think it was his way of saying, I don't think you're getting enough done. <laughs> and even being a tuba player, I was smart enough to realize what he was saying to me without really saying anything other than just assigning those. And that's when I thought I have to make a change here. So it was that way. And he played so well back then. I don't think. Um, Recordings really don't do justice right. to what he sounded like in the hall, right. what he did for the orchestra. Um, it, was, it was amazing. Uh, Civic, we used to get a dollar. Friday afternoon matinees were a dollar to get into. And so I was there almost virtually every week on Friday and after I got out of school. And just to hear him play and I remember him, you know, talk about motivating they were doing Rachmaninoff too. And there's kind of a wait and then you come in and you play maybe 60 some bars with the basses. Mm -hmm. And I saw him moving around and I saw him breathing. I saw his fingers moving and, but I couldn't really say there's the tuba. And then the tuba stops and the basses continue. And it sounded like the whole bottom of the orchestra dropped away. And I said, oh, that's what this is about. <laughs> so it's not about how loudly we play. It's, it's 
in Tabato, it's in, in, it's in Brian's book, how Tabato said it's really not difficult to play our own parts. It's fitting our parts with everyone else, knowing the music and knowing how we fit in to the music as a whole. And that's what he also motivated so strongly was the being an artist, being that it's an art form. Um, it's not tuba playing. In right. fact, if he called you a tuba player, it was an insult. Well, well and, and kind of along those same lines, I mean, I want to ask about Tabato, but we're outside of obviously uh, the CSO, would he ever talk about other artists he wanted you to listen to or, you know, soloists of other instruments or singers? We well, told you I always do Dieter Fischer Disco, of course. Um, I listened to a tremendous amount. That was when with Schulte, all those recordings started coming out. And, and the uh, Mahler 5 and 6 came out early on in the 70s uh, with Schulte. And they were really in their heyday at that point. They were all in their mid, late 50s Yeah. at that point. Um, I think the first time I played with them, Mr. Jacobs was probably 61 or 62. Um, yeah, but they were still, I couldn't keep up with them. I mean, and, and my first job in Chicago was with Mr. Herseth. And my last job in Chicago was with Mr. Herseth. So what was the so, first job? Well, there was an Easter job my freshman year. And all the tuba players had gone to Colorado to take the audition. I had no need to go to Colorado. So it was mainly people from Northwestern and Roger Rocco was in that in North Shore Band. It was mainly former Northwestern people that were in North Shore Band. And it was a sextet that was gonna play. And so there were those four people plus me, plus a guy who went to church there in Oak Park. It was his church. And I was, I always say to people, you know, you know how that is. You got to play with somebody who goes to the church. I go, yeah, yeah. I said, but I remember his name because it was Bud Herseth. <laughs> I was a little freaked out. He showed up and there was Bud Herseth at the church gate. Well, I knew it was, I knew he was going to be there. I'd been told and I was pretty freaked out. <laughs> But we ended up getting along just fine uh, over the years. But um, it was it was wild to be a freshman and sitting there with with Mr. Hersa. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> uh, what was the last job? Was it playing in the orchestra? It was. Yes, it was the last. Um, it was part of the audition for the job, yeah. and I did Tchaikovsky Six with them. Okay. And if you know Ravini at all, you really run like crazy once you finish the concert to get out of there before all the cars. Right. And there's a back lot where the musicians and and Mr. Herseth very kindly was running and saw me, turned around and came back and talked to me. I was from Minnesota. He was from Minnesota. We knew he knew my next door neighbor. He went to school with my next door neighbor in Silver Bay. So there, there are all these little connections. And uh, he was very kind. Well, yeah, I want to talk about that. Let's talk about when you started to play with the CSO. What was the first concert you played with Chicago Symphony as a substitute or as an extra position? Well, as an extra, uh, it was about three weeks after I graduated from college, they did Belshazzar's Feast, which has two offstage tubas. I got to be one of them, and the, the other fellow from Northwestern was the other one. Then the, the next year, um, in the fall at Civic, Mr. Jacobs said, there's going to be two opportunities to play this year. Um, you can either play Shostakovich 4, there are two tubas, and record it with Previn, or you can do the Japanese tour and play second tuba on Symphony Fantastique. And the other guy piped right up and said, I'll take the, Jap the Japan tour. And I said to Mr. Jacobs, I'll take the upfront money. I'm fine. I'll do the recording. <laughs> it turns out we did the recording. Yeah. And, um, and then the first time ever that they did it, I guess to save money, Jimmy Gilbertson played euphonium as second tuba on the tour. So there was only one, one tuba and then Jimmy was a, a, a assistant or associate trombone and then played euphonium. Oh, on the trust. So the other guy didn't get to play. <laughs> wow. That's a fantastic recording though. That's yes, a, it is. Very exciting recording. Yes. Um, and and what was and, and then you started to play a little more regularly 
with them after that? And Mr. Jacobs was getting older and wanted to take living so far south of the loop and Ravinia being quite a base, a long way north of the loop. It was a very long drive and trying to go back and forth. So he started taking quite a bit of Ravinia off. And so I started doing between Ravinia and the hall, he was also getting sick more often. Um, between those two things, I was probably playing 12 or 14 weeks a year with the orchestra. Wow. And then I also played in the quintet um, with Willie Scarlett and um, another trumpet player you might know, of, uh, Phil Smith. Yeah. And then, and then later George Vosberg, or and then Steve or Steve Hendrickson, and <laughs> the list of that second trumpet players just keeps going on. Tim Kent was there, um, and then uh, Danny Gingrich and Frank Crisofoli and myself, and we did all the youth concerts, the back-to-back -back things in schools. Um, and so, because Mr. Jacobs could make a lot more money sitting in at the Fine Arts Building teaching, although they paid very well, he still made more money. So, so you know, so yeah, you were around the CSO in a really interesting time. You just named off a couple of generations of trumpet players that were made major, major impact in, in, in the brass world. Can you talk about some of those personalities? I mean, I, I guess I would just start asking about people specifically. I mean, like, let's start with Mr. Hurst. What? Outside of the conversations you mentioned previously, what, what kind of things did you learn or you observe from him when you on the job? Well, that was the thing with all of them, that you could watch them. I, I was, I tell people how lucky I was. And I talked to my students about some of these things because I said, you'll never have the chance to play with some of these giants that I was just lucky enough to be able to do. And I do mean lucky. Um, to just see Mr. Hersa sit on that stage and just, there was no, you know, if there was tension, you sure didn't see it. And, you know, when I first started, of course, Vince Chikowitz, when I, or when I first got to Chicago, Vince was second trumpet. I later played with Vince in Brassworks Chicago, which was Luther Dedrickson's group, Sextet. Um, and um, Ch Geyer, Charlie Geyer was there. Yep. And, um, and Willie Scarlett, those were the, that was the trumpet section when I, got there for school. And then, um, you know, but to, to hear that quality just week after week and, and the work ethic, you could hear Herseth, if you were down, like we'd be down there for civic and you'd hear Mr. Herseth in one of the dressing rooms practicing Arbens. And just, there was a, there was a drive and they, they boy, they, they worked hard and they played hard. Uh, away from work. Um, but it was amazing to see that, um, you know, Willie Scarlet was always nice to me. Phil Smith was always nice. Um, I got along with, with the entire trombone section. It was, it was Jim Gilbertson. Of course, Jay was first trombone even back then. Yeah. Jay was first trombone in 1972. And then... 64? Am I right about that? Yeah. Something like that. He's still playing. <laughs> and uh, um, and then Mr. Chris Foley, and, uh, who I got to know at Northwestern, but then got to know much better after that. And he used to pick me up and drive me down to Orchestra Hall along with Jim Gilbertson for concerts. And we rode together all the time for quintets. Um, Ed Kleinhammer, who I got, got along really well with Ed. Um, and of course, Mr. Jacobs. Yeah. And of course, uh, Clevenger, Gail Williams was there. Um, Danny got in. Um, Dick Oldberg and Norm Schweikert, who just recently passed. Um, and Frank Brauch was last horn when I got there. Amazing player. And he played yeah. at some point. Yeah. It's just amazing um, group of players. It was just an amazing time to see that. And, and it kind of, they were all teaching at Northwestern. And that was the time at Northwestern when pretty much everybody there that made it towards the top of the studios got jobs. Eddie Kirken or Alan Kirkendall, um, John DeWitt, uh, Mark Camphouse, who ended up conducting and writing. Um, Gail Williams was there. Barbara Butler was there. Jim Olin was there. Max Bonecutter was there. I mean, it was just kind of a who's who. Lynn Neerheim ended up becoming bass clarinet in the Cleveland Orchestra. I mean, Bass players ended up in Cleveland and Baltimore. I mean, it was just an amazing time. It was just, just 
lucky to have, have been a part of that. Wow. Did, did any uh, discussions with some of those brass players that you talked about come up? I mean, were you, were you like in Northwestern, was Mr. Chickowitz involved with you there as a student? Were you getting any kind of coachings or playing for these guys? I took a course from him on, on orchestral recordings and, and listening to different styles um, that I did with him. That was the only thing that I did at Northwestern. The, the, what little chamber music was going on at the time, I'm sure it's all changed, was, was taught by GAs. Right, right. And because um, they were all busy with playing in the orchestra. Right. And so, I mean, I knew who Mr. Christopher was and all that, but I, I got to know them all much better after when I was down in the hall playing all of the time, either in Civic or with the Chicago Symphony or on recording sessions in town, um, because a lot of them played recording sessions. Now, was, now, Will Scarlett obviously kind of took the studio over uh, downtown after Mr. Jacobs passed away. Did you guys ever talk very much about Mr. Jacobs or, or about any brass playing things? We did some, um, you know, I know Will studied a lot with him. Mm -hmm. And so he, he felt that, but I don't know how long he kept that studio um, because it, it, it's, uh, John took it over. Oh, yeah, right, right. And, and as I don't, you don't even recognize the place now. We always joke, who knew the sink in that room was actually white? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Well, my yeah. with Will Scarlett were in that in that room, and that, the one I had with Mr. Jacobs was in there. But I, I know that uh, I remember so much Will talking about about Mr. Jacobs, and you know, it was Mr. Jacobs and Mr. Herset for every other every yes. other apology, of course. You know. And for a lot of them, and and Mr. Jacobs worked with a lot of the people, um, a lot of the, and a lot of the woodwind players, the woodwind teachers at Northwestern sent their students to Mr. Jacobs to get their sounds opened up and and all of that type of thing. So he was he was constantly working with all the different instruments. I was lucky to get to see him do a lot of that. I was lucky to uh, accompany him on, on some of his master classes and things that yeah. he did. So, and he used to give a five days at Northwestern every summer. I got to, I went and watched a lot of that when I could. Um, it was a great chance and we, he and I talked a lot, but I think he and Will probably did that, Scarlett, you know, in in the locker room. Yeah. When right. I was, you know, times when I wasn't there, that's when Will would have been over and talking and, and all of that type of thing. Now, and you were talking about teaching. I mean, I know Mr. Jacobs, there were a lot of, he would say you have a teacher hat and a performance hat a lot. Did he talk to you about that, about how to separate those two or any, give you any kind of pitfalls? Because I think that that's something that so many of us run into when we wind up teaching a lot. Yes, he, he warned me about that because um, I was teaching. I started teaching my sophomore year privately. And he said, I've seen a lot of great players start doing a lot of teaching. And he said, they, their playing starts going downhill because they start analyzing. The really neat thing about Mr. Jacobs teaching is it involved two things. It involved physiology and psychology. So we, it was really the whole idea of the sciences and understanding what's going on in the body from a from a scientific standpoint, rather than trying to figure out what it all feels like, yeah. because so often what it feels like, you know, when we blow really hard, we think we're using a lot of air. But Boyle's law is the higher the pressure, the lower the airflow, and that's why trumpet players have much lower airflow than say a tuba player. Right. But if you're using too much air pressure in different ranges then you're not going to be able to get the buzz and the sound that you need. So it's all normalizing that. So we have to learn that when we don't feel like we're working, that's actually when we're using a lot of air. Yeah. So there are so many things in music that are just the opposite of what they feel. And so he said, you have to not analyze yourself when you're playing. You want to record yourself and listen back and then analyze as you listen. That's one thing, but play. And then when you, when you teach, that's fine. You have to, especially you have to figure out what the actual problem is and how to work around that problem. Right. Um, so that the symptoms go away. If you, if you take care of the root of the problem, then the symptoms go away. Right. right. And people say, I, I got no endurance. Well, if you're blowing too hard, so the high air pressure is very high, then the mouthpiece pressure has to equalize that and be forcing back on the lip. 
But the only way you can drop mouthpiece pressure is to not blow so hard. So the question is, what is the minimal muscle efforts? Because he would also say, there is no sound without pressure. But you can have so much pressure, you don't have sound. Hence locking up. Um, yeah. And so, you know, it's, a, it, it's, it's an interesting, I think that's what helped keep it out of the emotion. It's much more uh, analytical in the scientific sense, not the musical sense, in when you have to fix a in problem mechanically. And then once they've done that, then you challenge it through musical means. Got it, got it. So uh, I was gonna ask, speaking of those, those musical means, was he, was he much on solfege with you? <sighs> Northwestern didn't teach solfege. Um, and I've always been sorry about that because some of the greatest musicians that I know, he, for one, Schulte would, had, could unbelievably solfege. And they sing it in a very musical way. So that's when Mr. Jacobs talked about using words rather than solfege. So we, this had to be my fifth year because we were working a, an, an excerpt. <laughs> and we were in the fourth movement of Symphony Fantastique where the octaves boom, 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 boom. And, and I'd been kind of making words up since I was in junior high school. And I never told anybody because I was embarrassed about it. And he says, you know what the words are for that, don't you? Now, at this point, he's got to be 64, right? Or 65. I said, you words? He says, oh, I use them all the time. He says, uh, horses, 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 tiny little horses, horses, or so that's what I mean. Here's this brilliant man singing horses, 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 tiny little horses. I used a different set of words for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> but yeah, uh, and, and you'll, in his two CDs that, that are out, the, the tribute of, you know, and the legacy, um, he talks about that that you, as you play, you sing. And one of the ways to get a player to really concentrate on what they're doing rather than how tense they are and everything else is to, for Kofi F5, uh, sweet Adeline, di -a -da, di -a -da, di -a. sweet Adeline. So many people have trouble with that. And if you just sing that, it's so easy to play it. Right. And so it was always about filling the brain with, with statements rather than allowing yourself to feel so much that all you're doing is asking questions. Yeah, right. And, and what he would mainly talk about, the reason we talk about this is, especially in the facial mass, there's, there's two main nerves that, that run the facial mass. The, the fifth cranial nerve is the sensory nerve. And the Seventh cranial is the motor nerve. The motor nerve tells the muscle to contract or release. That's all they do, they contract and, and how many to do it. And so that's the product in the brain. When we hear a sound, it translates that. It tells our muscles what to do. The fifth cranial nerve doesn't get the muscle to do anything. It's just kind of giving weird feedback. And an example I use about how we can't really know what's going on with our lip is I had to have a tooth pulled and, a, and an implant put in. And when they went to pull, it was like a, they, I went to a surgeon and he had numbed it up really well and he started pulling and it was like a cattle prod. He said, you can't be feeling that. I said, oh, trust me, I am. <laughs> and he gave me another set of shots and he started pulling and I, I felt it again. So I knew that the main nerve was going through the root. Right. For about four to five months, I was completely numb in my upper left quadrant. But I was back on stage because about a week after he did it, I'm going, I'm not going to be able to ever play again. But I just put my hand up. I went, <laughs> and it was the seventh cranial nerve telling the muscles what to do. The fifth just couldn't tell me anything that was going on. And so it certainly gave, obviously, real credence to what Jake had said, that it's the motor nerve that make everything happen. Um, 
and the part of the brain that does that is the cerebral cortex in harmony with some of the back lobes, but mainly the cerebral cortex. And that's where speech comes from, it's where movement comes from. I'll ask my students, can you uh, ask your lips how many yards are in a football field? And they kind of laugh at me. I go, that's really weird, isn't it? They go, yeah. I said, you're going like, wow, that's really crazy. They go, yeah. And I said, but you're the one who sits in the practice room two to three hours a day asking your lips questions all the time. And you're expecting an answer. <laughs> so, and another little exercise you can do, if you just put your, your hand down on your leg and you tell your hand to come up and have your index finger touch your nose. So if you put it down there and you say, okay, hand come up, index finger touch my nose. That's the way a lot of people try to play. Can you do this? Right. Yes. And then I say, did you tell the arm what to do? They go, no. I said, oh, your arm just does this all day, right? <laughs> and I say, that's the part of the brain that, come, that actually does playing. That's the quietness that can be going on in your head on stage. Other than hearing music, that's it. You don't have to be telling anything to do anything as long as you're hearing that music. And that was Jake's whole thing. Go for the product. I know you you have to encounter this all the time, telling talking people out of talking too much to themselves. Uh, in, in Jake's recording, he says, you can't do that. And, and he says that, and I'm teaching somebody, I go, oh, you can. It's really easy to talk to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that, that there are the the Bud Hurses, the Arnold Jacobses, the Yo-Yo Ma's, I mean, they all worked really hard. I mean, I'm not questioning that. There was that work ethic, but there was just something in their DNA where they, they lived in the zone. And I always say the rest of us get to visit it once in a while, if we're lucky. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think we all do that. And it's the training, especially in the practice room, where we have to teach ourselves not to be talking to ourselves. Because if you're teaching yourself to talk to yourself, it's okay in the practice room, then what you're saying is it's okay on stage. So what we do in the practice room, and, and Magic Johnson talked about this. He talked about um, how, I think it was Magic, um, that he would visualize people in the, in the seats and everything else during practice so that when he finally got out onto the court in a game he'd already done everything and that's the whole visualization mentalization in playing that becomes so important um you'd play an excerpt and mr jacobs would say play that again but imagine that you're sitting next to the four trombones and you're playing and you would play it differently yeah so it's the whole idea of imagination and and using that imagination and and exaggerating it enough so the audience ac actually gets a sense of it. Now, did you did you learn all those skills from him, or were were was he into like psycho cybernetics or any of those kind of books at that point? Did he have you reading any of that? Yeah, he told me to read psycho cybernetics. Um, I also read the, um, the. I think sometimes some of the books, the some of the inner game books. You can get yourself thinking about subordinate and insubordinate, and <laughs> you're, you're right back to talking to yourself. So for me, the, the simpler the words. But yeah, he talked about cyber cybernetics. There was Gray's Anatomy because I was interested in the subject. Um, the the not not the TV show. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> um, there's a wonderful book, um, Verlog Press uh, from Donald Proctor, on on the voice, and there's all sorts of fluoroscopes of, he was a singer, went to Peabody, but he was also a, a physician at, at Hopkins. It's not a very thick book, but it's really a wonderful book on the structures and everything that are in play as we, as we work. Right. Um, that, that's an interesting book. Um, and there's so many other books. Brian Fredrickson has, I think, all of Mr. Jacobs' library. And people can go up and, and I think Mr. Jacobs has highlighted a lot of things in there and all of that. So, so yeah, he, he was into that. It was interesting to watch Mr. T Mr. Jacobs teaching evolve. Right. 
because I know that in the 50s, there was a lot of physiology uh, and anatomy. And, and certain people from that time, which was before me, would talk about, oh, we're, we're donating this lesson to science. And it would be on all the equipment and everything. And he'd be checking different things on the equipment, where by the time I got there, he knew exactly what to tell me to do on a piece of equipment. I could see it, visualize it, I could remember it. And then that was it. I didn't use the machines all that much. Right. And he was getting very heavily into the psychology and knowing what he knew about the anatomy and physiology, and then getting into coupling it with the psychology when I was there. He got more and more, I think, into the psychology as he got older. Right. Because for many players, that was probably more important. And for people who are watching this that don't know the book Psycho Cybernetics, it's a book written by Maxwell Maltz yes. in the 60s. And yes. It was, it was, and it was really ahead of its time, I would, yes. I would say. Uh, and it's worth checking out if, you, if you've never read it, especially like the first, I don't know, 100 pages, especially, I think. Yes. It's incredible material there. Um, did uh, so also talk about uh, his the influence of Marcel Tabato in those lessons too a bit. Mr. Jacobs started talking to me about subphrasing is what he called it or the number system. Um, there is the book out um, Sound in Motion, right, and that's I think similar things. What was interesting to me was when Brian started to write the the song and wind book which is interesting because when we were all there, it was wind and song. Right. It's just wind and song, wind and song. So when Brian sent me that, I said, Brian, please get the title right. He said, no, he changed it after you left because everybody thought the wind was the important thing. I said, no, the no, wind is just the fuel to make the song happen. He goes, well, you know that, but he changed it because of that. But in that, what Brian sent me was a diskette that had all of the information he had scanned in for the book. And what he had done is gotten all of these articles, all of this stuff, and put this huge thing together. And then he would put in a keyword in the computer and pull out everything that discussed that particular word. And that was kind of how the book was formed. And there were pages and pages about Marcel Tabato. And in reading all of that, there's not that much in his book. Right. But after reading pages and pages of that and hearing Mr. Jacobs talk about how Tabato would say, you know, zero to 10 in dynamics for a tuba to play or a trumpet to play, mezzo forte, they'd have to play a three, but an oboe would have to play a six or seven to match that. And talking about how we, how we blend things. Um, talked about zero to 10 when we talk about dynamics, it's not just decibels or sound pressure. There's also the intensity scale. And sometimes those scales go together. And sometimes you can play a little bit louder with less intensity, not be so worried about playing softly. And it will sound softer because the intensity is less. And right. so it was all of these things. And I realized that a very large core of what Mr. Jacobs taught was what he learned from Tabato. And for people who don't know, uh, Marcel Tabato taught, was the oboe player in the Philadelphia Orchestra for a long time and taught at Curtis. And uh... he taught a course called musicianship, which everyone at the school had to take. So no matter what instrument you played, you took that course with, with Tabato. And one of the interesting things is there's a, a thing, a part in the book where it says, how often I've had, that he wrote, how often I've had the experience of teaching a class of three or four of telling one to do one thing and telling the next one to do the exact opposite. And that's why you never call it the Jacobs method because it was a Jacobs approach because it wasn't, it wasn't cookie cutter. It was different for everybody. Right. Right. And, and, uh, I also, I mean, I'm kind of going back to your time with the CSO because I wanted to branch into some other things in your life because you've done so many things. But what, what do you think, uh, well, first with Jacobs, what do you think some of the misconceptions are that people have of him? I know you might have touched on one or two of these, but, you know, he's been gone a little bit now and, and it's not as fresh with a lot of people like going to see him 
what, but I'm sure you've you've encountered those kind of things over the years. What people thought he was saying versus what he was actually saying. Well, what one had to understand is there are people out there that saying, "Oh, I studied with Arnold Jacobs, and they took four, five lessons." What Mr. Jacobs was teaching them was how to deal with their particular problems. So if they are pe those people are teachers and they go back and they start teaching their students those things, if their student has the exact same problem, then great. If they don't, they're going to screw them up. Right. So it's it's <laughs> it's much much more involved than that, and that's why especially being able to watch so many weeks of master classes of him dealing with student after student after student, all of them very differently. And I got to the point where I'd say, he's gonna use this piece of equipment and he's gonna talk about this. You're gonna use this piece of equipment with this person and talk about this. Now I'm gonna use any equipment with this person. And you begin to, and he and I talked about that a lot, Mr. Jacobs and I did. Um, so I think that's one big misconception is that, that he taught everybody the same. He taught everyone very differently. Right. Um, I think some people thought he said, don't use any pressure. Absolutely never did. But the difference was rather than jamming the bow onto the string really, really hard, what is the minimum you use to play a string instrument? And that bow is our lung capacity and how much pressure we're using on the air. Depends on the piece, depends on the music. Um, so he talked about that. So the, and he said, you have to have pressure. But what is the minimal you can get away with? But some people think he think he was saying, a lot of people think he's saying, you know, it's just you have to get in your head, then it'll be fine. You just don't. You're. It's not. You know, you're just not thinking the right way. No, we worked on my embouchure. We worked on my throat. We worked on my tongue. We worked on my breathing. You name it, we worked on it. So I think that's a misconception of it also. Um, those are probably the biggest things that I see. Uh, you know, it was an interesting thing is that he was very aware some people thought what he was saying because it was revolutionary back then. And to a certain extent, it still is today. Um, some people thought he was just full of baloney. He said, most people think that what I have to say is really good and I just go with percentages. And so that insight into what he was like. He didn't get all upset about it. It wasn't, you know, they don't believe me. It's, just, it's like, I do what I do. Right. And most people think it's really good. And I, and I think that's how he played. And I think that's why he was so relaxed most of the time. Yeah. He was also very, very positive. Was um, there a time when you were uh, particularly hard on yourself and he kind of dug you out of it with that something positive? No. <laughs> um, there was one time he did, and I've done it with several times with my students. There was something going on in my family back in northern Minnesota, and I felt I needed to go back. And we were talking in the lesson. I was talking to him. This was still in college. And he said, your family needs you. Go take care of your family. The tuba will wait. So, you know, that was that was really something. And I've told several students that over the time, over the years. Um, that was that was one of the things I mean, you know, I could talk to him about things like that, but he was not. It, it, the things were different when you were in that studio playing tuba. It, it one time came up and he said, People don't care what's going on in your life, good or bad. He said, they paid their money to hear you play and they expect you to play well. And he talked about a time when um, something had happened to his son down in Florida and he was in New York playing Mahler Five. He said, that was back when nobody played Mahler symphonies. And he said, I couldn't get a plane down to Florida anyhow. So he played the concert that night. And he said, years later, he bought one of the bootleg tapes from Carnegie Hall. And uh, he said, I sounded pretty good. And he basically said, sometimes you have to go on stage and lie like hell. So it was it was more about that. It was teaching a, a, the way you had to think to be successful on stage. Yeah. 
And the other part was kind of, you know, getting good grades in school was important to him. That was another thing people thought. He didn't, he thought school was ridiculous. No, not at all. Not with me, he didn't. Yeah. In fact, he used to say, if you get a job, you're going to teach. If you don't get a job, you're going to teach. So you better learn how to teach. So I actually have an education degree, yeah. not a performance degree. I was the only one who got a performance degree in the studio, and I was the only one who got a 52-week season playing job. So that's what I tell my students. Getting an ed degree doesn't mean you can't play your instrument or that you'll never be able to play your instrument. Right. I say an ed degree means one thing. You can teach public school. A performance degree means one thing. You can't teach public school. <laughs> that's it. Where you go beyond that is up to you. Well, I think somebody else who has a music ed degree is watching. I see on Facebook. So Gail Williams says hello, and she's oh, she's watching. So, so hello, Gail. And uh, and so and and the uh, the last part. I obviously I have questions written on the page. I'm looking at what make sure I get to them. But I wanted to talk just a little bit more about your experience in the CSO. What were the misconceptions there you had? from either listening to them in person or hearing recordings versus when you actually sat down and played in the section? Well, the, the sound that you hear on stage is quite different from what you hear in the audience. Um, I was taken back when I heard Mr. Jacobs up close when I was first studying and I think we all want to hear these beautiful sounds that we expect to hear in the audience up close. And it's a very different sound. And I think we have to learn what we have to sound like to sound right in the hall. Right. Probably my biggest misconception was when I was in school, some Mr. Jacobs got sick and and there was a Mahler II recording. And, and Somebody else from Northwestern got called in to play it. And I thought, gee, I would have been ready. Well, I can tell you this. When I played with the Chicago Symphony the first several times, I felt like years later, I felt like I'd never played the tuba before in my life. I was so scared that yeah. I was really glad that he had not had me come and play. <laughs> um, so, you know, they, and I'd, I'd heard them all play. I'd heard them play as teachers at Northwestern. I was so lucky to hear to hear all of them. And um, if we heard them play anything, I remember the horns playing um, some, I think quartets one weekend and at Northwestern, it was like, so I knew what to kind of expect, but it, it was the really neat thing about that orchestra is if you put the right note in the right place with a good sound, it made you sound good. And that was, that was a neat thing, but it, you know, it's, I don't think I had a lot of misconceptions there other than I thought I was ready to be there before I actually was. Um, and I'm glad that he did not. He, he just said to me, when I send you in there, I want you to succeed. Yeah. And that was several years later. Um, but, you know, and I was very lucky. You're talking about Gail. We had quintet that we used to play and everybody got jobs out of that quintet um, at Northwestern. And, and it was just, it was, a like I said, it was a very unique time. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and just being able to sit there and listen and learn, those were huge lessons those weeks that I got to play. Just hearing how, how all these different, and the string players and everything else, how they handled themselves. Um, it was a big learning experience. Yeah. You, you just touched on this in your answer. And I know that when I worked with you, you talked about it too, was the difference in the perception behind the bell versus what you expect to come out in front. Could you kind of talk about that? And that, that was a very, Interesting concept, the way you were explaining that. Well, the experience that I tell, and I'm, it's embarrassing now, but um, Mr. Jacobs was talking to me about articulation, and he said, give me your tuba. And I was a B-flat tuba player all the way through college. Didn't play C until I was about 27 and a half. And he played for me, and I thought I understood what he wanted me to do. So he said, there, you know, play that. And I did. And um, he said, no, give me your tuba. He played it again. And I thought I really understood what, what he wanted. And I took it back and I played it again. And I, the whole time I was thinking, he doesn't sound very good. 
<laughs> and uh, finally, he says, no, give this to me. Now imitate this sound. And I thought, boy, that really doesn't sound good. But I thought, okay, I'll show you what you sound like. And so I played it exactly how I thought he sounded. Yeah. Which wasn't meant as a compliment. And it got very quiet in the room. And I thought, uh oh, I've messed up again. <laughs> and he puts his hand on my leg and I'm going, oh no, oh no. And he goes, that's it. And for me, it was such a shock. And so I went back to Northwestern and I played for a bunch of people. I said, here's the sound I like. And this is the sound he wants me to use. I go, oh yeah, that's much better. So I really had to get my head turned around. I think so many of us have this concept of what we think we should sound like under the bell, which is kind of related to out in the audience. It's a more open sound. It um, tends to have color, but it can sound a little rough up close. Yeah. And, but it's, it's done with the buzz. It's not done with force. Because, you know, playing that Shostakovich for recording with them, there's a brass chorale that's like three Fs for several pages. And I was 22 and I couldn't keep up with those guys. And I realized, and they weren't missing anything. They didn't even sound like they were coming close to it. And I realized that it was being done through efficiency, like Mr. Jacobs talked about, rather than it wasn't chops. You know, when we were young, we think it's all about chops and strength and this and that. It wasn't that at all. It was just pure efficiency out of them. Well, so, well, then you, I know we could talk about your time in Chicago for hours probably, but <laughs> I, I do want to, uh, I did want to ask you about your audition for Baltimore and, and your process of getting your own chair where you played 31 years in the Baltimore Symphony. Uh, can you talk about that audition a little bit and when that was? And... Well, sure. It was the second audition of that year because I had spent the previous year with the St. Louis Symphony. They were between tuba players and um, Leonard Slatkin has asked for whoever was playing was first call in Chicago to come down and play the year. And so I played the year down there. Um, I came came in second in that audition to Gene Picorni. Yes, the tuba player with the Chicago Symphony. <laughs> and and uh, Gene's a great guy, great player. And so I had talked to somebody, some people I knew from Northwestern that were in Baltimore. And I said, I don't think I'm going to come out. I want to get the St. Louis job. But then I didn't get it. So I called and I said, can I still come out to the audition? And for me, it was a great audition because they said exactly what order you would be playing, what pieces, and exactly what places. So very much like, a, like the job, that you knew what you had to do. And so I went in and I played. And I found out that I didn't feel I played particularly well. I was a little surprised I got passed on um, in my head, talking to yourself. Yeah. And I found out that I had tied for the top number of votes for that day. And I thought, well, if you like that, I can win this job. <laughs> and so we spent another day in rounds. I think we did four rounds the next day. And then, and so I talked them into letting us know exactly what we were going to play in each order, each time. So for me, it took that worry about turning the page and wondering what I was going to see next. Right. And the hall was an easy hall to play in. And then the third day of the auditions, um, we played Rex Martin had been playing with Baltimore for that summer. Danny Brown, my predecessor, had had left, gave two weeks notice and left. So Rex played the, the summer. And Rex was in the finals and I was in the finals. And he and I both played with the trombone section a bit. And then we, at the end of the rehearsal that day, we played parts of La Forza del Destino, um, Benvenuto Cellini and Meistersinger. Both of us, back, he did it. He stayed on stage, or I, I played after him. They gave him a break from the rehearsal. And then I played, and then he played. And I heard Rex play, and he sounded really terrific. And I figured the job was probably his. But um, the personnel manager came down and said the job was mine. And 
Rex went back to Chicago. Mr. Jacobs was quite ill that year and probably made twice as much money as I did playing with Chicago, <laughs> but I did have the job. So um, that's, that's how the job went. Um, Sergio Comisiona hired me. Um, I think he'd forgotten I was the guy he kicked out of the audition in Houston quite a few years before that, because I, let me, this is a hint for everybody out there. <laughs> We're going through the extra book, right? You get to Capelia. Mr. Jacobs says, we used to play that all the time, but don't worry about it. Nobody plays that anymore. And guess what the Capelia, the, the ballet, guess what the sight reading was going up the high E and everything else. There it was. And I messed it up. Commissioner wasn't happy about that. But anyhow, Commissioner hired me. And then he left at the end of that year. And David Zinman was the director designate. And then David came in and we did all the recordings and all the touring. Um, Yuri Timurkanov was after that. For I think five years or so, and then Marin also came in probably in my last five or six years. Yeah. So, do you have any uh, memories at all? Of, I mean, all four of those major music directors, uh, like Comisiona, for example, was there anything you remembered about him in particular? I think we talked a little bit about that before we got on, but yeah, he had some great rep. He, there were certain repertoire he was terrific at. He did all the Berlioz overtures. He loved Rachmaninoff too. Um, he was a very emotional conductor and got the orchestra to play with a lot of emotion. Yeah. Um, it was a, a thing of, you know, orchestras tend to go, someone who's very expressive, maybe draws pictures <laughs> to somebody who's very technically oriented and then the next one will go reverse again. And um, that's a little bit, but it, it that can be a really great thing also. Yeah. Um, when you have the, the discipline of the Rhino years, then coupled with the ex with the emotion and excitement of the of Schulte years, but with that discipline, that's why I always said I I started going back after after eight years of studying with Mr. Jacobs because I was in St. Louis. I really had to depend on myself, and I started thinking like I did in high school about music, but I had the discipline that Mr. Jacobs had taught me, yeah. and so. It was the combination of those two things. And I think that's what kind of happened with Chicago to a certain degree and, and just the right players at the time too. I mean, but, we're talking about these conductors, I should ask you about, about Schulte and some of the other music directors you played under in Chicago. Cause uh, did you play under Giolini at all also? Yes. So can you talk about maybe Schulte and Giolini? Probably was Barenboim doing things? Barenboim played some. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, all conductors are different. People always go, do you like your boss? You know, do you like so-and-so? I say, do you like your boss? Well, some of them, well, it's, it, they're your boss. And, and I don't mean that in a bad way. It's just, you, it, it's more of a business situation and, and you, you have a job to do. Right. Um, I, I think that, that Schulte was, I know Mr. Jacobs felt was very, very kind. Mm -hmm. Um, Giolini, obviously very, very kind, a real gentleman, although he did one thing to me. Mr. Jacobs warned me, he was coming in to conduct pictures with Civic. Okay. And he says, he doesn't like the tuba player to play bead low. I said, okay. So the euphonium player plays, Giolini stops, he looks back at me, he says, do you want to try? <laughs> I said, that's okay. He goes, good. And then we went on. <laughs> so he kind of tried to, to trick me there. But but he was a very kind man. I know that. And he did a lot of really nice things to four different people in the orchestra and the stage hands and things. Um, Baron Boehm could be very demanding. Not in a bad way, but very demanding. Um, the best ones, they, they do demand. I mean, Maestro Schulte certainly was demanding, <laughs> yeah. you know, as, as Giolini was. They were just different ways of doing it. Um, it wasn't the old fiery way. It was the, uh, more of a kind way. Are there any recordings on uh, with those conductors that you're on with the CSO that we would be maybe surprised to know about? Um, Where are you making the course with Previn? I did the um, final Alice, the Del Tradici piece. Um, which was really funny. I ran into him. He played piano for his grandson 
for his grandson's audition at Juilliard. <laughs> um, we did that. The Berenbaum, there's a recording of all Tchaikovsky, um, March Love, Capriccio Italian, and things, yeah. where I'm on about half of it. Okay. Um, Mr. Jacobs got sick, I'm on that. Um, Rex did a lot more recordings than I did. Um, I did the Previn, I did the um, New World Symphony All with, with, with Levine. Yeah. That one. That was the first time I used a C tuba. And I had fingerings written under all 14 notes. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to think what other, there were maybe some other things I just don't remember for sure. My discography from Chicago is much smaller than Rex's was. Yeah. And certainly much smaller than Mr. Jacobs. But now you did a lot of recording under Zimmerman, though, right? We did. We did a lot of recordings with, with David. Zimmerman. So, and, and great. He was, he was great at running a, recording session he always said the lights made too much noise so they dampened down the, the stage lights and we use uh, stand lights and it created this kind of intimate atmosphere huh. and very calm and that was how we recorded all of the time with him uh, in our own home wow. and he also really was great with working with the recording engineers and and working on the final spent a tremendous amount of time on the final product before it came out. Yeah. So I, I think they're exquisite recordings. Yeah, yeah, there's some really excellent recordings, especially I remember the uh, the Petrushka in particular. There's you like that one? Recordings. Oh, yeah, you sound fantastic on the bear solo on that. So hmm. <laughs> do you like it? <laughs> you know, I don't listen too much to myself. I what I would go in and listen all the time when we were recording to make sure I was putting on the recording what I wanted sound wise. Right. Um, beyond that, you know, I mean, yeah, I do listen to it and, and then I go, okay, can do that better. I think that's why musicians complain so much is because it's always going to be better. <laughs> How do we make this better? How do we make it more efficient? How do we do this? And so we're never happy with anything. And what about with, what was, uh, what was it like working with Tamir Kanoff? Am I saying that wrong? Tim Rakanoff. Tim Rakanoff. Yeah. Um, very exciting. Um, incredibly expressive. It was, I always felt it with, with Schulte, whatever the interpretation was, it was the same every day that whole week. With, with Tim Rakanoff, you really had to watch because it could be real different from night to night. Right. And so there's, there was a spontaneity that happened. Just some amazing moments with him musically. Yeah. Um, just really exceptional. Yeah. Especially with the Russian repertoire, right? He does. Yes. Yeah. It, uh, yes. Yeah. That was one of the complaints some of the audience had is that they were, they were getting too much just Russian music. And, you know, they had gotten so used to uh, more contemporary things with David that is, you know, and a lot of people complained about too much of that, but I think they missed some variety sometimes. Um, and the guest conductors brought that, that variety in. Right. And of course, Marin brought that back. When she came back, she brought a lot of the, the, the more, you know, new things in. Right. right. Joan Towers pieces and, and things like that. And then, uh, and then along the way, you developed Baltimore Brass Company. While you're playing. Yes. Um. <laughs> you, you sound so excited about your business. <laughs> well, it, like so many things, you know, you fall into it. It just kind of happens. Um, it it kind of, I was an Eagle Scout and back in my tiny hometown, when we had Boy Scout pancake supper, the most anybody sold compared to me was I think 12 tickets. And I sold, I think one year 122 and the other year 140 or something like that. So I sold things. Um, but I had some of my own horns that I'd get rid of and I sold quickly. And then um, Bob Rusk, who used to be the tuba player in the, in the Milwaukee Symphony was cutting tubas. And what we would find were three old tubas like a Holton, there was no Holton in one piece. 
it took three different tubas to make one set of branches and bell and bow. And then I get a new set of valves from Gerhard Meinl. And I was selling those for some extra money. Um, Orchestra didn't pay that much. It paid okay, but it didn't pay that much. And, and uh, then the Canadian Brass came out with their line of instruments back in the, in the 90s. And I started selling those and out of my basement. And that all kind of one thing led to another. And I started the tuba business in my basement. And so I kind of started in 1992. And the reason it got its name was it was about two o'clock in the morning. I got a call from Germany that they wanted to buy a tuba. And I said, no problem. I can sell this. Well, we have to have a company name. I said, well, just put my name. Oh, we can't do that. It has to be a company name. So at two in the morning, we're going, okay, uh, Baltimore Brass Company. <laughs> That's how it happened. And, uh, and until 2001, I was out of my basement, did it all myself. In 94, I had a bad car accident. And I wasn't sure I was going to be able to keep playing. Um, I was in so much pain. Um, and so I knew I had to have money coming in. I had a son. We lived in Baltimore City, which meant he had to go to private school. And there needed to be some money coming in. And so that's when I started getting more serious about Baltimore Brass Company. And that just kind of grew. Um, I got told to move the business out of the house when when I had about $100,000 of instruments spread around the house and in the garage. And I think it was the new Barry Sachs in the box sitting in the dining room that was the straw that broke the camel's back. And so I had to move to a brick and mortar at that point. <laughs> and once you start, once you do that, and once you start having employees, you just have to keep trying to grow at least some to keep keep the bills paid. So that's what's happened. And, and it's, um, I'm very lucky I have great employees. And we are all, they are all back to work. I'm running it from down here in South Carolina, um, you know, by phone every day and, and, and that type of thing, but in, in emails. So it's, it's doing well. It's, it's, it's serving, it's serving the community, which is really what it's supposed to do. And for people that want to go online, tell everybody the website. It's uh, baltimorebrass.net. Baltimorebrass.net. And I do have some exciting news. We are finally going to join this century. And I understand it's going to be this in about a week. We will go live with our new e-commerce site Very or with our e-commerce, not our new one, our e-commerce site. We, we always joke, everybody getting a business together goes, okay, we got to have business cards. We got to have a logo. We got to have this. I said, I had the business for 25 years and then we got a logo. <laughs> Yes, we're going to be around for a while. We've got to get a logo. <laughs> so that was kind of how it all started. And it, you know, it kind of dragged me kicking and screaming. Luckily, it's grown small enough percentage-wise each year that I could keep up with it. Yeah, yeah. And you have a lot of stuff that comes through. Your, your stuff is very, very good. We try to be. Um, you know, Steve Dillon's is a, is a really fine shop. And, um, and Steve is incredibly knowledgeable. He's got good staff. And, you know, I saw all these good things he was doing and I thought, yeah, I tried to copy good things that uh, through my years I've seen in music stores and not do the bad things. And, and I'm not talking about Steve, I'm talking about as I grew up different stores and how they did things. Steve's has always been a first rate place. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, and then, you know, the, uh, I want to just ask a few other questions. Uh, I know your wife, Sally's a music educator, right? As well. Yes. And, and so I know that you guys have both done a lot of work in the music education field and, and you go out and do a lot of clinics. Um, if you could change, and, and it's obviously changed quite a bit since, since you grew up and even since I grew up, that if you could change a few things with, in any way possible, what would be the top of your list of top couple of things that you would want to change in the schools as far as music education goes? Oh, um, I know we don't have to be until 11. I know it's a big, yeah, no, there's, there's a lot of wonderful things going on. And I, I think what I would change, and, and maybe this will change with COVID is that parents need to be a lot more supportive um, that, and maybe they will be now that they've had their students at home. Um, it's challenging. Needless to say, especially for teachers right now, especially for anybody trying to do classroom. 
for me, doing one-on-one -on -one online is very easy. Um, I've had some students come into our studio class from other instruments to see what we're doing because they're not they're bored with what they're they're doing. And I think we as teachers, we as teachers have to be thinking, what would drive us crazy right now? And not do that with our students. I see so many, this, what I hear, uh, teachers are just assigning do more papers. And it's like, the kids are already under huge stress because of COVID and trying to learn online and everything else. And, and now they have all these papers they have to. So how do we not add that kind of work, but still teach well? And I think that, and, and also realize that each of us doesn't have to reinvent the wheel. We can share. And I think that's what Sally has done all these years. She has uh, an award-winning book um, out that's called uh, Pursuit of Excellence, mm -hmm. which is award-winning and, and used as a classroom book in a lot of places, a lot of schools. Um, her other one was, and she didn't name it, her, she wanted to call it, it's not rocket science, but <laughs> publisher, publisher gave the name. And, uh, and the, her second one, which she didn't name either is uh, Pursuit of Perfection. Um, very different books. The first one is for younger teachers, um, small chapters are very motivating. Um, she was an extremely uh, successful teacher. She taught four bands a day. Um, when they went to adjudication, generally all four of her bands got ones, and that was a grade one, two band, a two, three, a three, four, and a five, six. And so she had to pick all that music and do all that. Very successful at that. We did a book in for brass purchasing maintenance and troubleshooting um, that we did a clinic on at Midwest. And that's been real successful and had a lot of good comments on that. So I think we're trying to help. We do a lot of, of free maintenance that the teacher can teach the students mm -hmm. to do. I, I think it's I think it's that cooperation and, and getting the students to cooperate and and take care of instruments and all of that type of thing. Um, I think we have to figure out ways as teachers and students to, because money is getting less and less at schools. And so we have to figure out ways that you can save money and ways that you can bring in money. I think that's important. I don't know that music education is particularly messed up. I think a lot of the education field is um, yeah. with, with really great teachers being forced to, to do things like, sorry, Common Core and all of that, which tries to make everybody teach the same way. It's the difference in teachers and how they teach that make them interesting. Right. And you know, if you have to have a mentor teacher go help train a younger teacher who's not succeeding, then do that, but don't, don't bring the, the great teacher down to a lower level so that that type of thing. Um, and, and I think the pendulum swings. Yeah. And so I'm very actually positive about what's going on. Obviously we see a lot of people because of the business when Sally and I were out on the road all the time, picking instruments up, seeing people and all of that, there are some just phenomenal teachers out there. And I think there's a, a, a lot of that. And so I don't think that that's where the, the mess up is. I think the whole idea of STEM rather than STEAM, um, the arts are incredibly important. Yeah. And for some kids, if, they're, if they don't have the arts, they don't even bother to go to school. And so it's, it's, it's a misunderstanding. I, I also have very strong feelings about vocational training that not everybody should go to college. They're not, it's, if that's not what you want to do, if what you want to do is fix cars or you want to become a plumber or an electrician and make a whole lot more money than most people, um, you know, vocation or, or becoming an apprentice is really, I have huge respect for people like that, that can do that. And we're running out of those people. So I, I think that's a, a mistake that everybody needs to go and that everybody needs to have a, a, a doctorate. I have that discussion all the time with people. I just had it this week with someone and it was like, well, do you wanna teach full time in a university? And not every university, because you can be full time without it at a lot of the prestigious. Yeah. I had one school I suggested in Baltimore 
I suggested a particular person to do their low brass teaching. And they came back to me and said, and this was when I was teaching at Juilliard, and they came back and said, oh, he'd be perfect, but he doesn't have his master's yet. He's working on his master's, and we can't hire anybody who doesn't at least have a master's. And I, without thinking as usual in my case, what came shooting out of my mouth is, thank goodness that Juilliard doesn't feel that way. <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, I know. My, my teachers at Indiana and Cincinnati both had bachelor's degrees, and they did just fine. Yeah. So, on the other hand, in a particular university you're very aware of, if you didn't have the doctorate, you you started out at 50, 50 points instead of 100, and then each of your solo CDs was another 10. So I started with 20 points, and I lost from there. <laughs> there was a reason for that, yes. but it wasn't to get the job, actually. Well, you you dodged a... a, a yes, a, a I know. Book. But... <laughs> <laughs> But you're right. No, this the t there are so many fine teachers, and yes. they have so many things that they're going against that weren't there 20 or 30 years ago. I mean, the idea that a student can go into a public school and they only have band class twice a week is mind blowing to me. That they're not yes. every day, and that's not a thing to do with the teachers. It has to do with the system. Yes. But yeah. It's uh. It's. it's it's a really noble profession. And then I, I have to say in Atlanta, I see so many fine, fine band directors. It's, mm -hmm. you know, so, yes. but uh, yeah, and I guess uh, I'll just put you on the spot with one more naming a few things question. If you were going to start a young brass player, just any brass instrument, and you had to name three to five recordings to listen to, what would you want them to have on their playlist? Well, the first of all, I used to start a lot of beginners in Chicago. I taught five days a week, four and a half days a week of private students, and I, a lot of them were beginners. When Sally and I were working the Salvation Army conservatories in the summers, they always had me starting the beginners because it was so successful. We did something called Fast Track Band. And it is a pamphlet. So I'm not trying to sell anything here. It is open source. And if you get a hold of us, we will send you all the PDFs for it. Um, and it is, it has note speller in it. It has, you buzz before you ever get them to play. They love you buzz motorcycles, rainbows, frowns, smiles, um, all sorts of things, tunes so they don't by the time you actually put that instrument up there to their face they've already buzzed in many cases an octave or octave and a half you haven't talked about that you haven't gotten their heads that they have to do this little box thing and because of that the progress is extremely fast and then there there's a wonderful full page which sally did of one note solos and then two note solos is another page. Three note solos, four note, five note. Somebody was very proud they had made six and seven note pages. It's good for you. It's, it's simply a pre-primer uh -huh. because most books go so fast that if you think about it, the student is on that first page maybe a month, month and a half. They don't feel they're progressing because they're not turning pages. This, you're through the whole book in about 10 days. If we doing if you're doing something every day, yeah. and we've had several people use it and said, you know, by Christmas their kids were better than the previous year's beginners were by the end of the year. So that's one thing. If I'm going to listen, I'm going to have them listen to. It depends on how young they are, mm -hmm. but I'm going to have them, you know, I'm going to put on the Jacobs recording of "Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Wolf," the disc the disco version. <laughs> from the 70s um, you know I think we listen to to fun things so that they can hear their instrument what if you got a trumpet player and you put up uh, maybe blood sweat and tears and say you know you this is something we can do with the trumpet you show them what possibilities are and and you can show them how to play the trumpet but you say here are possibilities and this is what the music sounds like so beginning I think to what I always tell teachers is I'm not telling you what to do. I'm giving you some information 
and you use it however you want. But I think it's up to you to decide. And I'm not trying to dodge the bullet here. Right. You know, if I'm playing for my students, if I'm I'm dealing at say uh, at Maryland, I'm going to play the re-released Reiner recording of Meister Singer, which I do quite often. Um, I'm going to play the the low brass no, excerpt yeah. CD. You know, I'll play the stuff from Mr. Jacobs talking. Um, I, there's a broadcast tape of Glier III that I did at Philadelphia Orchestra to talk about the role of the instrument within the piece. Um, I, there's so much that they can listen to. I think we want to show them examples of great playing and say, it's like my high school band director put the Chicago Symphony on playing pictures with Reiner. Yeah. You go, oh, <laughs> you know, in high school. And so I, I think we, we underestimate what students can can really take in. They're yeah. a lot smarter than we think they are. I know Dave Saltzman, I think he's talking, I assume, he says the best recording of that he ever had on tape was the Big Bad Wolf. Recording is the best, but he can't find it. Oh, I have it. <laughs> I can get it to him. Speaking of smart guys, Dave Saltzman. Yes. But uh, anyway, but uh, David, there's, there's so much information in this, and I'm sure when I, I'll, I'll read, I'll, uh, this will be reposted on, on YouTube and then reposted on that page. I'll share it with you, of course. But thank you so much for spending so much of your of your night. I know it's been a while. and uh, I had big plans, you know. <laughs> you're going you're gonna to go out. I mean, you go into a different room. I mean. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think Hogan's Heroes is on pretty soon. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know nothing. So. Yes, but uh, thank you very much. This is this is great. It's great seeing you again, and you. Uh, I hope there's been some value here. Absolutely. So thank you. So hang on, hang on, just one second, and I'll okay. this off Facebook Live. But thanks so much for everybody that watched. Good night. Thanks, David. Thank you.